Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be learning something about the law that probably a lot of people throughout the United States certainly don't understand, especially when it comes to people who hold the peace. Everybody's screaming about how we need to get out there and defund the police all because of an incident that happened just a few months ago, which most of us probably agree with shouldn't have happened. We're going to be learning about the role of what it is of the sheriff to uphold the Constitution as the law of the land. We're going to learn about the power of the rights of the treasonous writers who in many cities across America actually don't seem to understand what this actually entails. We're going to also find out about the dangers of a possible civil war erupting in America that's fomented by radical leftists within the Democratic Party who are encouraging it. Welcoming to the Bayon 50 radio program today is Sheriff Richard Mack, who's going to be sharing with us this very thing. Sheriff Richard Mack, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Hey, well, Daniel, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, to be able to discuss these uh, vital issues that are facing our country today. Well, you know, it's exciting because, you know, a lot of people, you know, basically people are talking trash. Most of them don't even know what they're talking about. I'm sorry, but, you know, I think when it's, uh, and it's interesting because when it comes to, for instance, the Constitution, most of these people out here, they certainly know what the First Amendment is, freedom of speech. But, you know, there's a lot more to the Constitution than that. <laughs> you know? now, let's go ahead and first of all talk about how you started in your career, why you chose to become a sheriff, and exactly what that is, the sheriff's responsibility. Yeah, that's a $10,000 question. There's probably several $10,000 questions that you've already alluded to, but I uh, grew up under the tutelage of a FBI father, uh, we 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 are from Safford, Arizona. You know where Safford is? Yes, that'd be down there in the far, I think, southeastern region of Arizona, I believe. Correct, it is. Right. Uh, there's one county between Safford and or Graham County. Safford being the county seat, uh, and that would be Cochise County, which separates us from the border. So we're pretty close to the border, and I lived there most of my life. And um, uh, my dad was born in Graham County, and his Parents were both born in Arizona, and uh, so we're true blue Arizonans through and through. And uh, I always uh, wanted to be a, a professional baseball player, and I actually tried uh, to do that, and just wasn't quite good enough. And uh, tried out, was invited to a uh, Kansas City Royals tryout in Phoenix at one time. Uh, they were traveling the country. Obviously, they're not from Phoenix, nor have they ever been, but. They called together a bunch of players from Arizona, and I got an invitation. But anyway, that never worked out, and uh, I went back to college and and tried to get in the FBI, and that never worked out either. And while I was working my way through college, I uh, got a part-time job as a meter maid, uh, parking enforcement cadet is the official term for meter maid, and I really liked it, uh, uh, law enforcement. I really liked the police department. Uh, there at Provo, Utah, and uh, hired on uh, full-time after I graduated. About a year later, I hired on full-time as a cop, and uh, I started my law enforcement career. And something happened to me. Uh, I had an epiphany, and I started I started questioning things that we did in law enforcement. It, everything seemed to be a numbers game. Go out and write as many tickets as you can. And we didn't have a quota, but it was as bad or worse than a quota. Because if you weren't writing tickets, the, they would get after you and say, hey, what are you doing out there? And, and uh, you know, so I just didn't like, uh, you know, they would sit us down and say, okay, how many arrests are you going to make this this uh, coming month? And how many DUIs are you going to get? How many felonies are you going to get? You know, I, you know I, I don't know. I want to prevent all of those things. I don't, I don't want to increase them necessarily. So, Anyway, I just started questioning things, and uh, right after I worked a year as an undercover narcotics officer, uh, I really started questioning the drug war and the nonsense. It, it it struck me. I started studying it. I started studying about marijuana and, and uh, why government thinks it has the authority and, and responsibility to uh, go after people who 
who smoke pot and um if they're not hurting anybody else why are we doing this and so i just started questioning a lot of things and then one day i was writing a lady a ticket and she obviously didn't have money and i mean it was obvious she had probably no money she had about five or six kids in her car and it was a dilapidated, cruddy old Datsun compact station wagon that had primer gray showing through. And by the time I finished signing the ticket uh, with my serial number and my name, I paused for a moment. And I looked down at this dejected, depressed woman. And I looked at her snotty-nosed kids, some of them still fighting and crying. And she just was totally not there anymore. She was having a horrible day. And I wasn't making it any better, obviously. And then I looked at me. And it was the most penetrating gaze I'd ever felt in my life. And I asked myself a few questions. I, I said, Mac, is there anything you're doing here that's helping this family? What are you doing here? And then I said, uh, is there anything that you're doing that's making this a better place to live? And then I said, or I asked, is, is anything you're doing here bringing honor to the badge you wear on your chest? Well, I felt very ashamed at what I had become, that I had allowed myself to become a by-the-numbers jerk. And, you know, I was still friendly. You know, it wasn't like I was a mean guy or anything. Uh, in 20 years of law enforcement, I never shot anybody. I never slugged anybody. I never beat anybody in any way with a nightstick, never maced anybody or tased anybody, none of, none of that, okay? And uh, I never hurt anybody. I never, you know, I, I tackled a, a shoplifter running away one time, uh, and, I, and I pushed two guys down on the ground who were fighting. And that was the extent of any violence I ever inflicted on another human being while I, I was a cop for 20 years and eight years a sheriff. And so I, I just was not not ever a mean guy. Uh, right. But I still became uh, wrapped up in the by-the-numbers police work. And instead of service and protection and dedication to the oath of office. And so I started studying. I said, I'm going to find out why I'm a cop, why we have police, and why we even have government. And I set out to, to do that, but I didn't know where to look to find my, my answers. And, and the very next day that after I made this commitment to find these answers, I was looking around the uh, city complex, and I was looking around in the briefing room and some of the books and the law books, and I, I just kept looking. I didn't know what I was really looking for. I just knew I had to find this. And I went over to the city center side, and I walked into the city clerk's office, and I was just standing there looking around, and she said, Officer Mack, can I help you? And, and I said, yeah. When, when, and I don't even know why I said this, because it was never a topic of conversation for anybody, not, not between me and my family or my wife or anything or, or, or the police station. Nobody ever talked about this. And I, so I, I don't know where it came from that I just blurted it out. When I took this job, did I take an oath of office? I don't remember where I ever heard that. I'm sure I heard it somewhere, but it wasn't on my mind at the time. It, boy, I sure blurted it out. So anyway, she says, yes, you did. You actually signed it. And I said, I did. I signed it. I didn't even remember signing it, Daniel. <laughs> wow. And so she made me a copy because I was so incredulous. She goes, here, here it is. And it was dated March. And I don't know, remember the the day of the month, but it was March 1979. I was only like 24, 25 years old. And uh, I, I was so ashamed looking at that because it said, I, Richard I. Mack, solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully uphold, defend, and obey the United States Constitution and the Constitution of the State of Utah. So help me God. I see. And uh, I said, there's no way I'm keeping this job. I said, to myself, I'm a liar and a hypocrite. There's no way I do this. And then, I instead of quit, and I'm literally going into turning my my gun and my badge and my Sam Brown, and I'm going to leave right then. I'm leaving. I'm quitting law law enforcement. I'm quitting my chosen career. And 
Then I thought for a moment before I turned it in. I said, you know what? You don't have to quit your job. You have to quit being a liar and a hypocrite. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, I started studying. I said, okay. So I actually had the World Book Encyclopedia at home. No one had, had ever given me a pocket-sized constitution. And so I went and got the uh, World Book Encyclopedia, the one that said U.S. Constitution, and I kept it in my patrol car and uh, for about a week. If I wasn't on a call, I was studying and reading uh, the Constitution, especially the Bill of Rights. And, man, the Bill of Rights really hit me. And I'm telling you, the Eighth Amendment really hit me the hardest. I mean, there's a lot in there about police for, you know, warrants and probable cause and due process and – and. Uh, and it's amazing how much is in there about protections for both sides. Oh, yeah. You know? and, yeah. and I think that's what really sucks about this day and age. And I, and I believe in the next couple of years we're going to see a lot of that change, I believe, uh, for a different reason other than. But, you know, is the idea. I remember when I was growing up, and when you looked at a police officer, to me anyway, it was something that you respected. It was actually something that as a kid you thought about being a firefighter or a policeman. It was a respectable career. Yeah. And and it's really quite unique that you know as we got older obviously I was kind of a, a rough guy if you will getting you know in trouble in school that sort of a thing. I was just kind of a rowdy more than anything. And like anyone else in my position if you eventually get caught by the cop doing something. I remember my very first ticket was I was tossing a golf ball to a friend of mine who was in the back of a pickup that was driving. And I said, here, you want this? He goes, yeah. And so I bounce it right on the street there, and it, you know, <laughs> bounces off, you know, and it ends up hitting the truck. Next thing you know, here's a, a patrol cop, and I'm like, what the hell is this all about, you know? And so I got this ticket for striking a moving vehicle. You know, I didn't. I was a kid, you know. But it's funny because when you get in trouble, <clears throat> And I think a lot of people agree with this. They think to themselves, oh, man, you know, uh, well, you got in trouble, and that's just it. And I like uh, one of my favorite Clint Eastwood movies is called The Gauntlet. And uh, it's kind of like part of the Dirty Harry series without quite being the part of a, you know, he's not really Dirty Harry. But he's escorting uh, this girl from uh, Las Vegas to Phoenix, actually. She's supposed to be a witness in what seems oh, yeah, to be a yeah, nothing yeah. trial, yeah, right? But I love this scene. Yeah, They're actually staying she became his wife. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sa Sandra Locke, I, I believe, was the actress that played uh, the part there. But they were staying uh, apparently in Wickenburg, which is a town yes. I'm sure you're aware of uh, in, in Arizona. Yes. And they're in this hotel, and Clint Eastwood just kind of laying there on the bed. You know, they've had a pretty rough time, but they're relaxing. And he says, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, I used to hate cops. <laughs> and then he eventually <laughs> realizes, you know, and he says, but then I began to realize – you know, that cops were the only thing that he came to know that actually stood for something. And he basically said, you know, the job is simple. You break the law, you get busted. It's simple as that. And it really is that for the most part. <laughs> and, well, but, sometimes it is. And, yeah, yeah. And, and but so then there are other right. times, you know, that it really kind of maybe gets confusing. But I want to go ahead and let you get back to your story well, about... Is, the bottom line is yeah. uh, I discovered the Constitution and the oath of office. and uh, And so... That, to me, the oath presupposes that you know and understand and have studied the Constitution, especially from the viewpoint of the Founding Fathers. What was their intent? In law enforcement, we have to prove criminal intent by people in order to find them guilty. You know, if it was an accident, if you, if you accidentally leave a store without paying for an item, you have to do that intentionally to be charged with shoplifting. If you did it accidentally, and in fact, I've done it before. I went out to uh, tell my, show my wife something, is this what you wanted? And I go, oh my gosh, I just committed shoplifting. i got to get back in there. And I ran back in the store hoping nobody was coming to get me. You know, but uh, and I don't have to prove my innocence. They have to prove my guilt. But the, the thing that is here with me is I totally became converted to the Constitution because I studied it. And patriotism and federalism and the in, uh, intent of being free and, and the Constitution being a system of checks and balances and keeping government limited and out of our lives and off our backs and that we have a system of self-governance 
where government is not always mandating and permitting and 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 just totally running every facet of our lives. That was never meant to be in the United States of America. And we're not a democracy. What, to, to imagine my surprise when I found out. We're not even a democracy, for heaven's sakes, and the founders didn't even like democracy, and it was one of the worst forms of government that the founders assailed constantly. And so I said, man, we're a constitutional republic, and what is the role of police when it comes to preserving our republic? And imagine, now I teach that all across the country, and I formed a group called the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, CSPOA.org, uh, of which all of you can join. Every every person in America can join because it's a partnership between the citizens and the police. And then in 1988, I moved home uh, to Arizona and ran for sheriff. And, and that's a miracle in and of itself. I had never even worked there in law enforcement in, in any place in Arizona, and especially in my hometown. I said, look, I've, I've got 11 years police experience. Uh, I want to move home. I want to be in my hometown. I want to be the sheriff. And I barely won the primary, and then I beat the incumbent uh, rather handily. And then I was reelected in, in uh, 1992. And then in 1994, uh, I was, became the first sheriff in American history to file a lawsuit against the federal government take that case all the way to the United States Supreme Court, which is absolutely another miracle, and we won. Uh, and seven other sheriffs joined me in the lawsuit, uh, and that's only seven sheriffs out of 3,100 that actually told the Clinton administration the Brady Bill was the first time, and that's what we sued over, and the Brady Bill was the first time in history where a law promulgated by the Congress and the president uh, commandeered the office of sheriff for federal bidding, and it included a threat of arrest if we failed to comply. Wow! Oh, I know. And and so and only sheriff seven sheriffs sued, and and there was a, a lot of other sheriffs that didn't like it. I mean, there was literally hundreds, maybe thousands, who didn't like it, but they weren't going to do anything about it. Uh, you know, you, some of them gave us a nod and a pat on the back, but. Most of the sheriffs weren't going to do anything about it, and and uh, just said you can't fight City Hall, and I don't want to fight, you know, and I I'm too busy being sheriff, and uh, we did it, and I started the whole thing. It's an amazing case, and I'm going to tell you this right now, Daniel. Every person listening to this program and every person in this country needs to read about that case. It is the most powerful Tenth Amendment state sovereignty, local autonomy guaranteeing and strengthening local autonomy case that ever came out of the U.S. Supreme Court. Let me give you one t tiny quote. This, is, this was written by Justice Scalia. And by the way, I have a little review of the, of the Supreme Court decision. What I did is I put it in a little pocket-sized booklet, just like a pocket size, same size as a pocket constitution, so people can keep this with them and study and give it to others and give it to your sheriff and give it to other public officials. Because it says this, and I think this smacks right in the face of the coronavirus orders and dictators and whatnot going on, but it sounds like this case was meant for what governors and mayors are doing to us today to destroy the Constitution. And it goes like this, quote, but the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions, end quote. And wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody in government would understand that principle? That and, and how would that play out? How would it look? Governor Ducey or the mayor and city council of Phoenix or any of these other city councils and mayors across the state of Arizona who think they have some sort of authority to force me to wear something across my face. Right. You know, and that's a frustration for a lot of people, and, and you're hearing that bubble up, but then I know the underlying feeling is, what the heck can we do about it? I, I, I think people go along because they, well, they really don't know, well, but I have what that, do yeah, you do? I have that do? solution, too. Mm -hmm. But this is how, this is, if, if a 
if a governor or any other pu- these public officials that I just mentioned, if the mayor of Phoenix or city council or Scottsdale, whatever, if they were if they were really following their oath of office and they were really following the Constitution and understanding the principles of liberty that we have fought and died for in this country, how would that play out? And this is this is how it would sound. Governor would come out and say, we certainly hope everybody's listening, and we really hope you do the research, and we, we really want to encourage and beg you to stay in your homes as much as you can. We want you to wash your hands. What are they going to do, arrest you if you don't wash your hands? Right. We want you to wash your hands constantly and make sure it's long enough uh, so where you're really killing the germs. If you, if you don't do it long enough, it won't. And then he needs to go to that training. He needs to say, we, we feel that it's also beneficial, even though there's a lot of conflicting information, we think it's beneficial that you keep a distance from other people out in public and that you also wear a mask. And, and there's conflicting information on that too. But we want you to research it. We want you to look at it. We want you to do best for, what, for your family and your community. And if you go out in public, we highly suggest we highly recommend that you wear a, ma- a mask of some sort that covers your mouth and nose. And then I found out you don't need to cover your nose because it only is to block spitlets coming out when you talk. You don't have them coming out your nose when you talk. Not you usually, don't. anyway. <laughs> you don't, yeah, if you've got something coming out of your nose, you probably need to stay home because you got a cold. But this is, this is the thing. It would sound like that. Because the the mayor of Eager, Arizona said, we do not have the authority, and no one has the authority to force people to wear a mask. And and so we do have people standing, and we've already had uh, about a half a dozen sheriffs in Arizona, and there's only 15 sheriffs in Arizona. We already have a half a dozen sheriffs in Arizona said they won't enforce these things. And that's the solution to all of this. And we have been teaching that for the last 10 years, that when government is out of line, sheriffs and chiefs of police and peace officers, they all have the same responsibility. But how is the chief of police going to now keep his oath of office when the, the city council and the town manager want everybody to wear a mask? What's the chief of police going to do? He reports to them. The sheriff reports to the people. The people are the only supervisor that the sheriff has. He reports to no other bureaucrat, or and he reports to no other politician. He does not work for the governor. The governor is not his boss. The governor cannot fire him or hire him. The president, the president of the United States cannot tell your sheriff what to do. And my Supreme Court decision makes that very clear. And it's because, just to be clear about that, too, is the sheriff is really, uh, as far as I know, the only elected Law well, enforcement official, correct? That's exactly correct. Mm-hmm. And, you so, know, and when you think about it, it's kind of fun when you go back to the Wild West. You know, there's a new sheriff in town, and yeah. you always got the feeling the sheriff was the head honcho. It didn't really matter about anybody else. Right. <laughs> and he was usually the one out there on the street, too. You, if you remember that uh, the movie, what was it, High Noon with Gregory, or no, not High Noon, but uh, it was Gary the one. Coop- what's that? Gary Cooper. Yeah, Gary I Cooper. Yeah, well, it was I Noon. I, I almost got it confused with another movie that it had to do with a B-50, B-17 bomber, but that's okay. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yes, but no, I, I, I quote the uh, High Noon thing where the sheriff uh, is trying to get a posse and where, you know, finally the people came uh, to back him up. But at first they were all too afraid to. But in Arizona, the sheriff can order the people to come and be on his posse or do whatever he says in defense of the county and keeping the peace. And so, yeah, that thing is, that sort of principle is carried on from uh, the existence of our country. In fact, three of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were former sheriffs. The sheriff was the first office here, and I've I've done a book about that, uh, The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope. Uh, Also, that document I told you about, the, the victory for state sovereignty in the review of my Supreme Court case, Sheriff Prince and I were the two sheriffs that actually ended up at the Supreme Court together. And so if you Google Mac V U S or Prince, P-R-I-N-T-Z, uh, but you'll get the case, and it's all over the Internet. And Cornell University did the best review of the case. 
that I saw from anyone and in any institution. And this this whole thing about what you said, the sheriff is elected, the sheriff reports to the people. The sheriff reports to the people within the promise of his oath of office. And and so this is really unique too because it, you know the Declaration of Independence says well the the will of the people you know because by the consent of the governed the consent of the governed is is that we have a rule book called the constitution and that we will adhere to it so if 99% of the people uh in my county want me to do something wrong or unconstitutional I cannot do it because I promised them when I took the job that I would uphold and defend the constitution and that's the key thing there even if they ask me to violate the rights of someone else and 99.9% of the people say, yes, we want you to do that, you have to do that. No, the right of the individual still outweighs the right of the mob mentality, and I have to stand for the one. And that's why the sheriff would have to do everything he could to stop the mob from coming in and lynching someone in his jail cell because the right of the individual carries the weight as much as the right of the of the majority. And that's what we forget about, and that's what makes us a republic. And now on that republic is the rule book called the Constitution. Now, I know what's uh, fascinating for our listeners to come to understand, too, is especially when it comes to the federal government, you know, coming into a town and uh, basically exercising what they feel is their ultimate authority to uh, uh, to give you an example i remember it was in the state of california who was one of the states that first passed uh the idea uh, uh the selling of marijuana that you could actually open up a store and uh, j- at that time though it was more like by prescription you had to have a card to be able to go right. out and buy it before the recreational uh laws were passed but they were showing how these federal agents were just going into these stores and confiscating everything and shutting them down. Because I'm thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. If it's legal in the state of California, what are these federal agents doing in there? See, and that's, that's an overstep on the federal government. Right. Well, it was obvious because they were operating by law. They opened their business. They had a business license. By law, they were allowed to do that in the state of California, but yet here were these federal agents kind of stepping in and just stepping all over the law because they were federal agents. And So people get really confused about what is the extent of the law, where are its limits, so to speak. And I like that you had talked about the sheriff earlier as being someone who serves the people because especially when in the state of Arizona, Governor Doug Ducey was shutting down businesses there was one sheriff that was saying, look, I'm not going to enforce this nonsense. That was Sheriff Mark Lamb. Right, okay. So let's talk about what was going on there. Well, yeah, that's a great example of the sheriff doing what he's supposed to do, despite and notwithstanding uh, the political pressures from the governor, who is the same party as he is, (laughs) you know? Right. And and so uh, this is Sheriff Mark Lamb standing and doing the right thing. In fact, he was on Fox 10 here in Phoenix, and he was interviewed, and he, and he said, we'll go and check on these businesses. We will. And he says, but we're not shutting anybody down, and we're not arresting anybody, and we're not citing anybody in. And then you know what he – do you remember what he uh, closed the interview with? No, that I don't remember. We need to get back to the Constitution. And that's a quote from Mark Lamb, and we even put it in our CSPOA newsletter – because that's exactly what we, we've been after. We're, we're after uh, de-escalation, and we believe that the Constitution and the enforcement of it is the greatest de-escalation our country could ever experience. Because peace officers would therefore understand that their role is not to hurt or punish. Our role is not to punish. Our role is to bring a suspected person who has violated the law or the rights of somebody else before a magistrate or judge and have them answer to their crime. And even then, the person is considered innocent until proved guilty by a court of law and his right to a jury must be respected and it must be maintained. And so the the law, the rule of law, is to protect all citizens, whether guilty or not, 
But when you when you have all those protections there, it certainly protects each one of us from abusive government. And a peace officer who is truly understanding his role in all of this could never hurt another person, no matter how much uh, they have done, even if they slap the officer. The officer can only take enough action to prevent a recurrence of what just happened. So he can't shoot a person for slapping him. We can't, in fact, on this, I've had people that I've arrested before start talking about my daughters or my wife or my mother. One even said the worst things possible that you can even imagine and not imagine about my precious mother, my angelic mother. Uh, And I still am not allowed, as much as that might offend me, I'm still not allowed to beat him or hurt him, or especially when he already is handcuffed, where I can teach him a lesson that you don't talk about my mother like that. First of all, he doesn't even know my mother. My mother doesn't want me to defend her honor by hurting someone and letting him bait me into doing something stupid because he talked about my mother, who he doesn't even know, will never know, and will never even uh, ever see her in his life. So understanding that my role is to uphold and defend the Constitution and that I'm actually a guard of the Republic and I'm a protector of liberty and I'm a guarantor of the rights of the people I deal with. Their rights are paramount. They are the utmost importance to the American system. And I'm part of this system that guarantees this person the right to fairness and a right to justice. And so when we, when we really get that and we move from being what I was once, a by-the-numbers jerk, and we move to being a true protector and a true servant to the people, then we know that person that I'm arresting is part of that system. And my job is to guarantee that every one of his rights is attained and, uh, and obtainable by him. And uh, if, I'm, if I start going against that system, I become the crook. And I'm worse than the person that I just arrested. We mm-hmm. cannot let that happen. Must we have become a lot easier for you to sleep at night, too, when you found that you were actually going back to being honorable in a profession that has a lot of honor, actually. We should, and you're right, absolutely. And it should be an honorable pr- profession, and people should be able to trust us. And we should be out walking the streets and checking with neighbors and people sitting on their porches or their kids playing in parks. We need to be out there, and we need... We need to make sure they know who we are. And we cannot pretend that it's okay to patrol our streets and the people don't even know who we are. How are they going to trust people? How are we going to really trust that we're, our streets are being trolled by complete strangers? No. <laughs> and, and I, I don't know why, but for no, I know why. You know, when you think of Sheriff, for me anyway, growing up, you think of that wonderful show, Andy Griffith. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> and to me, I was like, you know, that's how it should be. You know, the cops are hanging yeah. out. Yeah, you're kind of getting out of line. Hey, watch yourself. But you always got this feeling there were just plenty of second chances. You know, nobody really wants to just become a, a serial screw-up, so to speak. But, you know, it gets to that point where it's me versus them and, and them versus me sort of a situation. And, you know, it's a pretty rough place, especially for people who want to be in law enforcement. It's not really to enforce the law. That's the secondary part of why they do it. It's really because they truly want to serve and protect the people. But you think about where some of these people in law enforcement end up being stationed and it gets rough when for instance even your own so uh bosses if you will are working against you and obviously we're seeing a great idea of what i'm talking about here when you look at these big cities like portland where i lived uh chicago illinois you know you're looking at baltimore and, and you're looking at all these cities where there's just chaos and 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 now all of a sudden here's donald trump our president, stepping in and saying, look, we're getting sick and tired. What is it with these mayors and governors in these cities letting this happen, but then going after 
Donald Trump as he says, look, I'm going to send some people in there and get this stuff stopped. And yeah, even the Chicago. people in these cities are saying, hey, we welcome this. The police officers are saying, yes, please, come on in and help us with this, because our own dadgum city officials don't seem to want to be doing much of anything. Yeah, and, and you would think that they would want to uh, get the law and order uh, back in the, and create some peace and get rid of the chaos and looting and, and murders. And I'll tell you uh, what, here's, here's an interesting thing. And if you go on YouTube, you can see a lot of these kind of things going on. For instance, in Portland, they were talking with uh, a representative in Congress, not uh, the mayor, Ted Wheeler, who was an idiot before we actually left Portland for some of the ridiculous things he was doing. But right. they were talking with uh, this one woman who was part of the West Side Congressional District. And, well, we don't want these federal uh, officers. It's not troops. They're officers uh, going, coming into our city and disrupting things. Then what does she do? She alludes to the idea that we need better leadership from our president and rattled off this nonsense about the coronavirus. Well, the coronavirus isn't tearing down cities, you know, buildings and, and, and oh. so forth. Okay, and now here's what's fascinating. Just yesterday... That mayor of Chicago, or not, yeah, the, the city mayor of Chicago, do you, and I, I kid you not, verbatimly said exactly the same thing the congresswoman in Portland did. What we need is leadership from our president, you know, the coronavirus, da 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 da. That has nothing to do with what those federal agents are there for. <laughs> not the right. coronavirus, they're there because your city is going down in flames, people are getting shot and killed. Well, probably the biggest <laughs> uh, hypocrite. Um, is Governor Kate Brown of Oregon. Because when the Bundys had entered the Malheur building near Burns, Oregon, she begged for president and wrote letter to President Obama at the time and asked him to come and take care of this, that this was costing the state of Oregon $100,000 a day, and they wanted an immediate uh, end of this horrible, horrible situation. And these people weren't even doing anything. They weren't looting. They weren't killing anybody. They were just sitting inside a empty federal building. Now, I didn't agree with that, uh, and I didn't think it was a good idea. And uh, I actually tried to talk them out of there. Uh, and you're going to go to jail and somebody's going to get hurt. Well, LaVoy Finnecum was killed. Uh, his family believe it was a murder. Uh, Kate Brown uh, had her state police there, and I believe that she's, uh, uh, in fact, they're suing the state, and I believe she's going to lose that. They've already made an offer to the family of several million dollars, and the family refused it. But the, she asked for President Obama to come in there and take care of it. Now that there's murders and all sorts of uh, violence and, and pol uh, public and private damage to property and, and destruction of, of uh, monuments. Now she says, President, stay out. You have no authority here, and we don't want you, and we don't need you. Uh, well, first, uh, it's obvious that somebody needs to do something because all these Democrats uh, in charge of the government in Oregon are doing nothing. And so that is – actually, I'm a big-time states' rights guy. My Supreme Court case is all about states' rights. But when local authorities are not doing their job and, and that negligence is exposing people to extreme danger and life, liberty, and property are being destroyed, then any other government has the obligation to step in. The sheriff should be stepping in. The state police should be stepping in. Local police should be stepping in, which, as you already alluded to, they don't have enough um, manpower and, and uh, uh, wherewithal to get it all done. So, of course, you would ask for help, just like she did with Obama against people who were not committing any acts of violence. But now there's all sorts of acts of violence, and she doesn't want any help. And you see, she wants it both ways, and this is typical with – uh, the liberals and the leftists, and this is what really concerns me, is that they continue to do this uh, communist takeover 
uh, of the country, and if it if they think, and this is what really bothers me, if they think that this will hurt Trump's reelection uh, possibilities and chances, then they're going to allow this to happen, and they can say, "See all this violence that happened under Trump's administration," and that's all this is about. Because when you have a, a mayor in Chicago who wants to blame Trump and tell him to keep his uh, people out of here and you keep the federal agents out of here because you're making it worse and Portland saying that Trump uh, sending federal agents into the Portland area is making it worse. How could it be any worse when they're just standing there protecting federal buildings? But this is all political, and these Democrats have said this to America. We are willing To let all of this happen, we're willing to let the burning and the looting and the killing go on, and they give no reason for it. So you have to know it's all political, it certainly isn't constitutional, and it certainly is uh, a malfeasance in office because they are refusing to protect their citizens from this carnage and from all of these crimes. And for God's sake, uh, yes, somebody needed to do something because they're not doing anything, and Trump, Trump stepped up. And I will tell you this. I also really like uh, one of the iconic Democrat presidents who actually did something similar. It wasn't a, as violent. There was some violence around it and surrounding it. But it was when JFK, in I think 1961, sent federal troops into uh, Alabama to make sure that black students were allowed entry into the University of Alabama. Right. Governor Wallace was trying to stop it. Mm-hmm. And JFK said, if you're not going to protect equality and the rights of all citizens, then I And he stepped in and did it. Now you have to wonder, too, because to me I kind of see when I see this kind of, especially the blatant dereliction of duty of the the uh, Chicago mayor. It's like, why aren't the citizens stringing her up or, get, you know, just running her down the street getting – Yeah. or you take a look at California and what the governor's been doing to that state. Well, we and, still have – let me just interrupt there real quick. Sure. I have sheriffs in just about every one of those states that are standing against their governors, especially California. Yeah, especially California. God, that state there is hurting hard. <laughs> Can you believe California is <clears throat> even standing against? We have Sheriff Bianco in Riverside. We have even the sheriff in Sacramento, which totally shocked me, because that's a pretty liberal area. That sheriff, Sheriff Scott Jones, stood against the governor and said, we're not enforcing this stupid mask law. You know, we don't have any authority to do that. And still, that's back to my original statement. That's what true leadership would look like. We can't enforce that. It's unconstitutional. You see, that's what we do at the CSPOA. And I want to ask your audience, do you want a constitutional sheriff in your county, or do you want a sheriff that will just go along to whatever these dictators are telling them to do? Good question. Yeah, it's definitely become a very complicated wor- world to say the least, especially with all this. And you know, and I, I, I don't know. For some reason, I feel like after November's over with, and you know, God willing, things turn out well for all of us, that all of this will just seem to evaporate. <laughs> like this was all created in the first place because it's election time. I'm afraid that uh, we're looking at one thing really worse. And I think it's the message they're sending us. Um, And it really, really has me worried because they're making this so political that if Trump wins re-election, what do you think the streets of these big cities are going to look like then? Yeah. And and that's really scary. Uh, As a matter of fact, I don't want to be anywhere near Phoenix uh, when that happens. And I live in Phoenix. Um, I I just don't think uh, it's going to go well. Uh, I think it's going to agitate the agitators even more. I think the uh, powers that be that are funding uh, Black Lives Matter and Antifa, I think they're going to tell them to really let it all out and go for it even worse. Uh, and and I, let me tell you this. Uh, I was in law enforcement 20 years. I ran my own jail for eight years while I was sheriff. Uh, I followed politics and and 
justice uh, my whole life, but especially the 20 years I was there, I know what justice is, and I know what it's supposed to look like, and I know what's supposed to, what is supposed to happen lawfully to make justice uh, successful in this country, to answer the demands of justice. I know what that is. And I want to tell everybody, I wish I wish I could talk to all the Black Lives Matter people in Antifa and any rioter. Uh, first and foremost, somebody that we all know and respect, a great leader in America, whose life was taken way too soon. Martin Luther King told all of us not to participate in violence and that violence multiplies violence and that it provides no solutions. He also said, and this is where everybody needs to really pay attention, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So we need to take a softer approach to this and try to work our problems out in a mutual, uh, mutually satisfactory, satisfactory manner. And, and that is what I'm about. And I believe that everyone who follows the Constitution will come to that same conclusion. But there's one thing else about this that I want every single one of them to know. I still see signs up. No justice, no peace. In other words, we're going to keep doing this and we're going to keep rioting until there's justice. And I imagine they're talking about for George Floyd. Sure. But let me tell every single one of you, every wheel of justice that should be turning in that case is turning more rapidly than I have seen in just about any other crime. The, the suspects have been fired, have lost their careers. Uh, the suspects have all been charged criminally. One was second-degree murder. Uh, the other people were uh, crying for first-degree murder. Any judge or, I mean, any lawyer knows that that is not first-degree murder. First-degree murder means you planned it out. You, you staged it. You wrote it down. You told other people. You said, this is how you planned it. He would have to show, they would have to show that that officer planned to arrest George Floyd and then kill him. Uh, and and that's, that's going to be po- impossible. And second-degree uh, is, is going to be a little bit difficult. But I believe second-degree is appropriate. But every will of justice that is supposed to happen in this type of a case is spinning forward just as it should. It's rolling forward just as it should. So now tell me, what are you rioting for and what are you really after there? Well, there's not only that, but you take a look at too as the black community as a whole is looking at this scratching their heads going, what's all this nonsense about? I mean, we thought we were out here protesting for this, which they were, yeah. but pretty soon it's being dominated by a bunch of white people who I think are actually trying to, I don't know, uh, work off their karma for past misdeeds dealing with slavery. So they're out there doing this. And, and finally, uh, it seems like a fair amount of the black community is pulled away from this. And then, yeah, this is going the wrong direction. I don't want to be a part of this sort of a situation. Well, nobody, sh- nobody should want to be a part of it. And so you really, uh, I would really like to see the investigation Who's responsible for this? Who's actually paying these people? Who's paying these rioters to do these sort of things? And I don't think that's going to be that difficult of a of an, of an investigation. You know, if, if George Soros is, is paying people to riot, it's different. And I admit, people donating to Black Lives Matter, and there's been even Disneyland, even Disney has done that. And I don't know if they did it so they would say, oh, good, don't – this." Don't riot near Disney or don't do anything to Disney, so we'll pay you 100000 or whatever. I don't know if it's that kind of extortion deal or not. But uh, the truth be known, if, if anybody was paid to riot, uh, the people paying and donating should be arrested, uh, definitely investigated, uh, and then let justice take its course with those also. Uh, but if these rioters are paid to be there to protest, and then they rioted on their own, fine. Arrest every one of them 
and uh, and I hope I, I hope they rot for at least ten years in prison. Uh, any of the murders, those people should be looking at uh, life in prison. Mm-hmm. And uh, Seattle, I mean, that's a typical, uh, ridiculous uh, notion from the the mayor there saying that this is oh uh, this is a block party, uh, and yet at, at the same time, uh, no problems with the Bundys whatsoever committing any act of violence or even uh, any significant damage to property. And yet they're the ones that they really went after. So the hypocrisy there is is almost unbearable. But uh, that's what you get from the left. And sometimes I'm not a big fan of Republicans, especially nationally either. Um, You know, we're all supposed to be upholding, defending the Constitution and living by American ideals. And that's where it really bothers me with both parties. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. I think the first thing uh, that I would suggest for our listeners out there to do is why don't you get out there and read your Constitution, find out exactly what it is. We've had people who have come on the program. uh, There's a professor out of Texas, actually, who teaches the Constitution and constitutional law. And he, quite frankly, says, uh, and there's some amazing things to come to learn about. For instance, did you know that if you own a car and you have the actual title, you know, the original title of the car, that if you're driving down the street and an officer pulls you over, uh, they can give you a ticket. However, you don't have to worry about it because you're operating private property. (laughs) You know, and he comes up with these different things, and he says, but I will tell you, when it comes to living the constitutional values, it won't be easy in this day and age. And when you take a look at the, and I consider it genius of what the founding fathers had drafted, you know, their intention was also to have a documentary set of laws or rules, if you will, that keep us in an ongoing debate to improve more and more on it so that people have civil and sovereign liberties. And, and I think what's sad today is, as I said earlier, that most people can quote the Constitution's First Amendment. They might know about the Second Amendment. But do you know what the Fourth Amendment is? Do you know what the Fifth Amendment does? And well, so forth and so on. The eighth, the eighth yeah. Or, <laughs> I even tell you, the eighth is no cruel and unusual punishment. Right. No excessive fines or bail. What do you think traffic tickets are? They're excessive fines and bail. Why do we do that? Well, because we're bringing in money. Exactly. You know, or you take a look at, for instance, these people that are sworn in to be public servants, you know, for instance, in Congress, and you have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, when you ask her about the government, and she says, well, the three bodies of government are the House, Congress, and the President. I'm thinking, (laughs) are you out of your mind? (laughs) I mean, we learned that when I was in grade school, (laughs) and that's your answer, and you're in Congress trying to set, you know, policy and so forth, and and you just, oh, my God. I teach eighth-grade American history, and my eighth-graders, 90% of them, already know more about it than she does. <laughs> but it's sad. Yeah. And these are people that swore the oath of office to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States. But then you have Ilian Omar running around talking about how bad America is. And I love what Trump said about, you know, I think they're called the squad. There's four of them. Right. It's like, if you guys don't like the United States, get out. Go somewhere else. And that's right. my feeling. Well, what's really sad, you kind of alluded to this, what's really sad is I don't believe today if, if the Constitution were running for office, uh, if anybody would, uh, if, if it would win. I mean, there would be about a third of the people that say yes, and the, and the founders warned us that the greatest danger to America would be politicians that ignore the Constitution. And America dies without the Constitution, That's what, and that's what we're seeing, and it's breaking my heart to see this happen because they're – They've always been very incremental in chopping off the Constitution life and the the lifeblood of America through the Constitution. For instance, all the 20,000 gun control laws that they've enacted in this country. It was a little bit here and a little bit there, and, oh, we'll scare you into believing that gun control will actually keep you safer, uh, and that's another big lie. Uh, But it's, it's, it's not incremental anymore. It's bold in your face. Look at how far down we've gone just in four months in this country. And first it was the coronavirus and, and uh, that government can somehow 
uh, create uh, a dictatorial order and dictatorial authority that, oh, if it's for your own good, oh, I mean, if this is going to help you, then I get to destroy anything that made America great. I get to destroy your uh, ability to make a living. I get to destroy your business. I get to destroy your bank accounts and your savings accounts. And, oh, well, we get to destroy anything good about America. Oh, and then when, when the crisis is over, we'll give it back to you. Let me tell you what my case says about this. Not only did Scalia say, and the Supreme Court in this 5-4 split, thank goodness we won, uh, but not only did he say the Constitution protects us for our own best intentions, but he also went and said it protects us from the crisis of the day. May we not put concentrate power in one location as an expedient solution to the crisis of the day. And that's exactly what our leaders are doing. Uh, And I don't want to call them leaders because they have assumed a a much more different role than leader because I believe they're more destroyers than they are leaders. Leaders will do the right thing even though it's hard and messy. Doing the right thing is keeping your word, keeping the Constitution intact, and keeping your oath and upholding the rule of law, and that might get messy sometimes, but that's exactly what the Constitution was meant to be. Messy for you, hard for you to do anything to destroy liberty. And and there is never any authorization. Yes, I admit it, there are some state statutes that say the governor can declare a state emergency, but that does not authorize him to destroy the liberty of any individual or to force us to walk around with a mask or we go to jail, like Inglewood, Colorado now, has a $2,600 fine and a year in jail for somebody who doesn't wear a mask in public. Are you kidding me? Oh, my. <laughs> yes, and that's it. What, how about they do this, that we all crawl uh, around uh, anytime we're in a store so that we don't uh, get our face next to any children uh, or anyone else who's vulnerable. Let's crawl around on our hands and knees in the stores. And if they told us to do that, how many people would do that too? Because there's a bunch of sheeple crawling around right now, bowing down and kowtowing and groveling before dictatorial government right now. And this is not authorized. It's not okay. It's immoral, unlawful, and unconstitutional. And and so I'm having a real hard time because I'm supposed to go back and teach school in a couple of weeks. And they want me to wear a mask. And, and I again, they as I me, say, it's like, what can you do, though? I mean, no. people know inherently what the right thing to do is. We mostly cooperate because we're looking out for each other, but when you start enforcing laws like the one you were talking about in Colorado, yeah, well, not even laws either. what do we then do about this? I know. Well, the first one you'd have to say is uh, we do what Rosa Parks did. We don't comply. We have civil disobedience, and I use Rosa Parks in a lot of my presentations, and we should all be doing the same. No. I will not comply. No, I will not do this. I'm not going to do it. You can't make me do it. I'm not doing it. And it is, okay, you're going to jail. Well, you may do that, but I am not complying. And that's how strongly I feel about this, and I'm probably going to lose my job over it. So. Yeah, no easy times, that's for sure. No. It's like, you know, what you've seen is, well, I have rights, but your rights have now ended because I'm exercising mine, and your rights seem to end when somebody else's begins. And after a while, we're all, uh, yeah, no easy solutions here. <laughs> no, and I don't think, uh, you know, imagine if George Washington were running for office today. Uh, I don't think he'd get reelected. People don't want. Uh, honesty and self-governance and that government will make sure that the playing field is equal, equal opportunity for everybody. 
but not equal stuff. And we're not going to be uh, doing all this welfare state stuff that the founding the founding fathers were against that sort of thing. And uh, I don't have the authority to take money away from your neighbors and give it to you. And if they don't give it to me, then I arrest them or I kick them out of their home. There's no there's no authority to do that sort of thing. Forcing charity is not charity. That's tyranny. Forcing your neighbors to be charitable to you, that's not charity. That's tyranny. That's, that's government abuse at its worst. So here we are, and I'm telling you, I'm not liking what I'm seeing. Uh, like I said, it's breaking my heart. Uh, we need to get back, just as Sheriff Lamb said, we need to get back to the Constitution. Folks, we train sheriffs and peace officers all across this country. If you want to help us with that, we need your help. We're not really funded. We get funds from you buying the books that I mentioned. I've written eight books, seven books there on the website, cspoa.org. Join us in this holy cause of liberty. Be a part of this. There's probably one or two peaceful and effective solutions out there. We've seen what happens when sheriffs stand for freedom and against tyranny. We're seeing it every day. We praise Sheriff Lamb for what he's done, Sheriff Schuster, new sheriff in Yavapai, Sheriff Rhodes, uh, Sheriff Napier in Pima County. These are sheriffs that are already standing and doing their jobs and, and keeping their oath. May we create hundreds and hundreds more. And we can if, if you'll join us and help us with this cause. Yeah, and let's bring honor back to law enforcement in general. I mean, I, I know the big general consensus about this defund the police nonsense is oh. people don't want that to happen. In fact, it's oh. been shown that about 80 to 81% of blacks and whites are saying this is ridiculous. Yeah. This isn't what we wanted. I don't know where this came from. But, you know, and, and I think what we see, and I know that you and I agree in this, is the sheer lack of ignorance that's going on out there by people is mind-blowing because people should at least have a basic understanding of the Constitution by late grade school, junior high school at the latest. And when you got a congresswoman in there who's 30 years old <laughs> that doesn't even know the basic bodies of government... She at got least reelected in the primary, and I, she I did was by that. I said she got rid of fifteen thousand jobs from Amazon. Amazon left, and where do Democrats think jobs come from? Or the money for all these great big deals, you know, where everybody gets yeah. basic. Uh, yeah, we. I don't even want to talk about it. I'd rather stay with the honor of the law, for instance. And yeah. you know, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be on the program. Would love to have you back to talk more about all this. Uh, geez, things just seem simpler in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> <laughs> At least when they were yeah. protesting, you yeah, understood cool. what it was, was about. Back so. then. And then you know, the big problem with uh, happening at schools was gum chewing. Yeah, exactly, sticking it under the desk and so forth. Yeah. Now, go ahead for our listeners and give out that website again. Okay, it stands for Constitutional Sheriffs Peace Officers Association, C-S-P-O-A. Org, CSPOA.org. Everybody can become a member. It's not just for law enforcement or former law enforcement. It's for citizens and law enforcement. Well, very good. I want to thank you so much for joining us today here on the program, uh, Richard. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on and to, to let people know, you know, there's some members out there hopefully burning into fires that will uh, be on the positive side of things. But brace yourself, like you said, uh, it's pretty rough out there right now, so. It Again, is, thank you for, for having me. Yeah, you bet. Love talking about this stuff. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. See you next day. We want to thank any of the listeners out there for tuning in. You can discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. Keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.